Welcome to Hollywood and Beyond Podcast with Cincinnati host Stephen Brittingham. Experience meaningful and in-depth interviews with Hollywood's most interesting people. Enjoy the show. You can receive all the latest episodes of Hollywood and Beyond with Stephen Brittingham delivered to your favorite listening device by subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or whatever happens to be your favorite podcast listening service. Don't miss out. Tune in. Hey, this is Carrie Genzel inviting you to join me at DeadCon, one of the largest horror and paranormal conventions in the Midwest, taking place October 15th through the 17th in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I will be signing autographs and taking photos as well as taking part in a Walking Dead panel. You can get your tickets at deadconvention.com. I hope to see you there. And now, your host, actor and writer, Stephen Brittingham. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Hollywood and Beyond with Stephen Brittingham, who just happens to be me, your host. No matter how you may be listening to this episode today, whether it is via Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Podbean, Spotify, or even on Audible. How cool is that? It is so nice to have you listening. Thank you so much. I have not one, but two special guests joining me on the podcast today. Together, they make movie magic. Behind the scenes, their collaborations extend to a personal level as husband and wife. Today, they are visiting Hollywood and beyond to discuss their upcoming horror film, Demigod, slated for release on October 15th in selected theaters and on demand. Demigod takes viewers to Germany's Black Forest, where a woman returning to her birthplace after her grandfather's death encounters a terrifying secret. Let me just put it this way. That is an understatement. Starring the immensely talented Rachel Nichols, once again, my guests have achieved yet another impressive film. Director, producer, screenwriter, and most definitely an actor, Miles Doliak and his super talented wife, actress Lindsay Ann Williams, are both my special guests today. Welcome to Hollywood and Beyond, you two. Hi, Stephen. Hi, thanks so much for having us. Hi there. My pleasure. Thank you for being here. Uh, Wonderful to have you both here. I think both of you are so talented. I enjoy watching uh, your work uh, so much. And thanks for visiting me here today. I really appreciate it. Our pleasure. Lindsay. Lindsay. Excited to speak with you for the very first time. So I want to say an extra welcome to you. Uh, Miles, I should say welcome back. This is actually your third visit to Hollywood and Beyond. But if you add the appearance that you both gave on the Instagram Live Takeover a while back for the dinner party, this would actually be like your fourth visit, Miles. Repeat offender. That's me. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you what, I really appreciate it, and that takeover was so much fun. I'd like to let anybody listening right now, if you happen to miss it, I am in preparation to release that recording, audio version, here on the podcast, because it was so much fun. So stay tuned for that, for sure. Well, where are you uh, joining me from today? We're in the great city of New Orleans, Stephen. Glad to hear it. I'm here in the Queen City of Cincinnati, and a uh, beautiful day here, beautiful fall day. Feeling pretty good about the Bengals uh, on Thursday night, eh? Yes, sir. <laughs> I sure am. Let me tell you, I just woke up uh, with an extra big smile on my face, and the coffee tasted extra good. Uh, come from behind victory is, 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 is wonderful. I'm, I'm so proud of them, and they definitely showed a lot of heart last night. Yeah, for sure. 
Well, let's see. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to actually uh, learn more about this. How did the two of you actually first meet? Oh, uh, we have, we both went to Tulane University. Um, I got my bachelor's degree there, and Miles got his PhD there. Um, and we were in an ancient Greek class together. So in addition to our artistic endeavors, we both share a love of the ancient world. He's got a PhD in ancient history, and I have a couple degrees in classics and ancient history. And um, so we met reading Homer. Well, that's, and the rest, as they say, is history, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Indeed. And, and speaking of history, you you know, you, you described it very well there. You both um, have a strong background in history and, and all sorts of things. Uh, I believe this extends to mythology, um, you, Miles, you are definitely a very well-rounded individual, and I can see that shine through with your artistic projects. And uh, Lindsay, you are just uh, just wonderful to watch. Very, very talented. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I'd like to ask um, if uh, either of you could please describe to the listeners out there uh, more about the storyline of Demigod. The storyline of a demigod is, as you articulated briefly in your introduction, um, a woman and her husband return to the woman's birthplace in Germany's Black Forest uh, to claim uh, an inheritance uh, that her grandfather has left her. Her grandfather has left her all of his worldly possessions, including his creepy cabin in the middle of the Black Forest. And um, she has been estranged from her grandfather for, for many years, but this, this inexplicable connection remains. Um, so they arrive in Germany um, to find that said inheritance is uh, a lot more complicated and even terrifying uh, than they bargained for as they fall in with the priestesses and cult of the demigod Terranunos um, and Terranunos' annual uh, ritual hunt. Uh, so they, they quickly find themselves captives uh, to the cult. And I, I don't want to spoil anything from there, but as our story unravels, we find out more details about Robin's family's connection to Terranunos and his legacy. Excellent description. Thank you, Miles. It has a very nice buildup to the film. Uh, it kind of uh, uh, snowballs into more and more information. I find it mysterious and atmospheric. It uh, looks like it's also a very cold setting. <laughs> uh, where did you actually film the movie? We filmed the, uh, the whole thing at um, the Little Black Creek campground um in lumberton mississippi i uh, had no idea that mississippi was going to be quite that cold but it worked very well for atmosphere for us <laughs> <laughs> it sure did i mean i mean goodness uh just uh the imagery it just must have added so much to it uh despite how chilly it may have been i mean i started watching the film and i wanted to grab some hot chocolate right away that's the idea Stephen. That's, that's precisely what we were going for. And it was a cold <laughs> Mississippi December, let me tell you. Um, and one of the things that Mississippi shares with the Black Forest of Germany is piney woods, lots of evergreens, pine, spruce, fir. Uh, so this forest we were in at, in Lumberton, Mississippi, was a pretty close approximation to Germany's Black Forest. We sort of studied the, the geography and the, uh, I guess, the... The herbology, is that the correct terminology? Mm. I don't know, of the Black Forest. Um, and and it, 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 it comes off. It comes off. I've had a couple of interviewers ask me if we actually traveled to Germany. And I said, not on our budget. Uh, not, <laughs> you know, not, for, not for lack of trying, but that would have cost a great deal more than we had at our disposal. So we're, we're very happy that, that it came off. I tell you what, it I mean, if I didn't know 
where it was actually filmed, I may have uh, started to wonder if you actually did go there to the Black Forest to film. Because like you said, uh, it's just wonderful, wonderful uh, setting and the evergreens. It was just uh, fantastic. And and um, I imagine that um, you had a certain schedule in mind when you were filming this movie. Did you keep that schedule? Did you need extra time, extra days? Or how does that usually go for you as a director, Miles? Do you Are you one that usually stays right on your uh, time schedule for filming? Well, uh, one of the logistical obstacles of shooting an independent film is you have a much shorter shooting schedule than, than a larger studio film. Um, I think the longest shoot schedule we've ever had on one of our films in six features is 23 days or so lens, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so for this one, we literally shot this movie in 14 days. Wow. One four. Um, that's amazing to me, which was, (laughs) yeah, which was one day less than the dinner party. Yeah. We shot the dinner party in 15 days. This was 14. Um, and that was just a matter of budget. That's just, once we, we, we pulled together all the resources we had at our disposal, we looked at the, looked at the money and we looked at the script and we said, we got to do this in 14 days. So, um, we do a pretty good job of, of hewing to the schedule only because we have to, we don't have much choice in the matter. Sometimes you have to punt scenes, uh, that you anticipated shooting on one day to another day or, or something like that. Um, but we we really don't have the option of going over. Um, so we we force ourselves to be disciplined and and to and to keep that schedule. And uh, you know we we have been faced in the past with tough decisions like do we don't know that we can get this scene? Do we need to cut it from the movie? So those are the really tough choices that independent filmmakers have to make um, because you really just rarely have the option to give yourself another day or two. So on this one, in fact, um, our last day of shooting, we were plagued with some pretty awful rain uh, that really, and we were outdoors. We were in, you know, a, a place where we couldn't make it work with rain. And we asked a couple of people, uh, key crew members, key cast members, like, is there any way that we can just squeeze one more day out of you? And it just wasn't possible. So that's really where the creativity of the crew and the way that we work together as producers and with our other producer, um, Wesley O'Mary and Jim Boulian, how we just, you know, we didn't have the option to push. So we had to make something work with the rain. And we didn't end up having to cut anything because of that cooperation and the um, creativity of our crew. It really did come off and we got very, very lucky. But, you know, you can't always anticipate these things on an independent film, but you don't always have the option to do anything but make it work. You know, when I view your films, Miles, as a viewer, and I think of you as a director, it really coincides to what Lindsay just shared. And that is, I always get the feeling like I'm watching this team effort, cast, crew, all involved, And I just feel that's one reason why your films turn out so well. Well, I think you're, I think you're exactly right. Um, I have, um, a a proven team. This is the same team of producers that shot the dinner party. Uh, Lindsay, myself, Wesley, Jim Boulian. Um, we oftentimes have, uh, return crew members, We've used the same production designer on our last three films, Julie Tosh, uh, for example. Uh, The the fact of the matter is on an indie budget, you have to have buy-in. Everybody has to be behind the vision. They have to believe in what you're doing um, because they're not there to make money because there's not me. You know, we do our very best uh, to do right by our crews and to pay them as much as we possibly can, but it's still not what they would make on a bigger TV show or studio film. So you, you just, you have to have the complete commitment of your cast and of your crew. And I think we, we have had that people believe in what we're doing. Uh, they know we're going to take care of them to the absolute best of our ability. 
in during the COVID pandemic. Uh, they they knew we were going to keep them safe and we were going to uh, strictly abide by the protocols uh, that our unions had handed down. Um, and they and everybody brought their A game and we made it happen. Um, and there's really no other alternative in indie world. You just you have to have that commitment and that buy in. Has to be about a lot of love, no doubt about yeah. it. Yes, sir. An impressive results, Miles. I, I just like the way you set up so many of your shots. I think that they're very well thought out, and I like how you keep the focus on the character while at the same time trying to prevent a very appealing imagery to the viewer. You put that all together, and, and it just uh, just hats off to you once again for your achievement. And I find this film to become very gripping as it goes along, very intriguing. I wanted to find out what was really going on as I was viewing it. So I'd like to ask you, though, due to the nature of the storyline, oh my goodness, (laughs) Uh, I think this might have been the most frightening thing I've ever seen you uh, film, Miles. Uh, How did the inspiration or the idea for this film first develop for you? So uh, after, as we were wrapping the dinner party with this team of producers um, that had been behind that film, uh, we very much wanted to do something else together. And we wanted to do it quickly to capitalize on the momentum we had generated from the dinner party. So my co-writer on the dinner party, Michael Donovan Horn, had uh, this, this wild hunt script uh, that he wanted us to take a look at in consideration of production and passed it along to Linz and I. We, we took a look at it. Um, and I, I thought, I thought it had potential. And, and so we started working on it together. Um, we, uh, I, I added some of my own, um, ideas. Lynn's had some great ideas that, that she brought to the table, um, including the, the explicit, uh, connection of the hunter character to the Kernunos mythology, which I think really, really kicked the doors open. Um, in terms of, I think, what, the, what this cult is about, what they're trying to do. The Kernunos is an old school vegetation deity, and vegetation deities are always the most vicious. They're always the most complicated because, of course, human beings' connection to the earth and the land and the ability to, to raise crops and command the beasts of the field is absolutely essential to their very survival. And all those things are governed by these old vegetation deities, whether we're talking about Dionysus or, or Demeter or Kernunos uh, or, or the German Herney, whoever we might be talking about. And so uh, that was a sandbox that I was very eager um, to play in. And, um, and then we, uh, in the initial draft there of the script, the, uh, the Amalia character was a boy, a little older, and I just thought it would be much better, uh, as, and, and as did Lens, if it was a, a girl, a younger girl, uh, especially because we were we were because the attendants of Terranunos are female, and we saw this potential to connect the Robin character with this this young woman, both of whom are dealing with complicated relationships to their parents and or grandparents. Um, and a, a, a bit of generational trauma. Um, so we just, we just got to work and, and, and got dirt under our fingernails and, uh, and, and built something that we were really excited about. And of course, you know, as you know, you've seen the dinner party and hallowed ground too. I believe I love to explore, um, religion and ritual, um, and cult ideology. And, and that's part and parcel of, uh, both lens and, and my interest in, um, in the ancient world. Um, and, and of course, Kernunos has ties to that world as well, going all the way back. Some connect him to the Roman underworld God, Dispater. Uh, so it's really just, a, it's, 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 it's the whole, the whole realm of, of Kernunos and, and the tentacles of his cult are really, really fascinating. You do like that theme. Yes. As a filmmaker. And I can, it's very obvious that you are also, you know, uh, one who takes it uh, upon himself to be accurate and and research uh, it yeah. all out and and bring another element to it. You don't. You're not one that just go. Okay, 
here's this uh, myth, and I'm just going to throw it in the film. I mean, you really feel like you are a part of whatever scenario is going on, and I really like that. Have either of you actually been to the Black Forest? I have been to Germany, um, but I have not explored the Black Forest itself. The, the, the time I spent in Germany was in the city of Munich um, for six weeks one summer, which was a most excellent six weeks especially the beer drinking portions of those six weeks. Um, <laughs> I bet. <laughs> but uh, but <laughs> uh, so I, I, I really immerse myself in, in, in um, the, I, I would say the, the metropolitan culture of, of Germany and Munich and, and its history, but I have not explored the black forest itself. It's on the list. It's on the list. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I tell you what, I have actually read where many folks consider the Black Forest to be a haunted forest. Quite true. Quite true. You, you want to take that one, Lindsay? I know we were talking just recently about Herney and the Wild Hunt. Well, so uh, the German god Herney and Terminos are actually cosmetic if you look at the language and the development of their name. Um, and so just based on sound, turning us is a little bit more, I don't know, interesting. Um, but so that's kind of why we were able to use this myth and bring that into this kind of haunted forest thing and still keep it in a Germanic setting as opposed to having to move it to some more Celtic land. But um, uh, yeah, in terms of the haunted forest, the Black Forest is pretty much where it's at, right? You've got all of these, um, you know, Renaissance, Myth writers and uh, the Grimm brothers and all that stuff. That's all, all based here in this spot. So it's a very spooky place. It's a really, really rich area to mine for those, you know, scary stories. And the wild hunt in the forest is always close behind. And Lindsay, these like the, the storyline of your film. I mean, it has a connection to real myths from germany is that correct oh, people go missing and there there is like a you know people who invade the depths of the forest are then you know they go missing because they disappear as tribute right to the sprites and spirits of the forest so there, that's always an element mm. and the and the wild hunt narrative is yeah, the the wild hunt narrative is is definitely connected to the Black Forest, um, and you know we've heard you might have heard in some country songs that Ghost Riders in the Sky that that is connected to the wild hunt uh, narrative and the the spectral spirits that that um, are in the entourage of of these hunt deities um, that that annually during the winter solstice, oftentimes in the mythology. Um, invade the black forest or, or come out of hiding maybe um and just had, had this this hunt ritual where where blood is spilled in the interest of um a sort of renewal and and rebirth uh of the natural world that's actually one place where we do diverge a little bit from traditional mythology and traditional ritual which um in terms of vegetation gods tends to happen during the autumnal equinox, which is around the, the harvest. Um, but we've moved it to the winter solstice just because it's a little spookier, a little bit more interesting. But the autumnal equinox also is very closely related to um, rituals that turned into Halloween and all of those things. So it's a really interesting area and time to play with. And speaking of Germany... I was taken aback, Miles, when you started speaking in German. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, yeah. I was just unaware. I was like, "Oh my goodness, he's yeah. he's speaking German." <laughs> yeah, he, he express our ambition Deutsch. Yeah, um, ah. I speak a little German. <laughs> um, that's what I was doing in in Munich as part of my graduate degree. Uh, I had to learn German to be able to read some of the scholarship in German. Uh, I've lost a lot of it. So, um, many and sincere thanks to our German dialect coach, Oliver Hopper and the wonderful, talented Elena Sanchez, who plays Latara, uh, 
who was thrust into that role at the last minute due to a COVID issue. And, um, and, and, and um, Leilena speaks German fluently. She has a German parent. Um, so she was able to be sort of like an onset dialect coach. And then we had a remote dialect coach in, in Ollie, who uh, is a native German speaker. Um, so we knew that would be a challenge, right? About 30% of the dialogue in the film is in German. And that was important to us. Um, we wanted to create this distance, this otherness um, for our English speaking audiences. Um, but we knew it wouldn't be easy. Um, and I feel like it, it comes off pretty well in the film. And the talented Rachel Nichols, who just gave up outstanding, strong, and emotional performance in the film, Miles. Uh, folks no doubt know her from her time on Criminal Minds or 2009 Star Trek, just for example, because she has a long list of um, of credits, but she also speaks German in the film at times. Yes, yeah, a little bit, and, and she, you know, it's just an absolute delight to have Rachel on this film. Uh, I've been a fan of Rachel's work for many years now. Um, some of the titles you mentioned, Star Trek and and Criminal Minds and Continuum. And, you know, she's a man in high cast. Conan the Barbarian. Conan, right. Um, G.I. Joe, Rise of Cobra. Rachel's Rachel's done a lot of really big, there big stuff. And um, so it was such a, a treat and so gratifying that she was willing to take a chance on our small film. This was the first film she did during the pandemic after the outbreak of the pandemic. Um, and you know, it's heartening that an actor of that stature is, is willing to take a chance on an indie film project in an indie producing team. Uh, but she did, and she was absolutely lovely to work with. And I'm, I'm proud to say we have kept in touch and, and we continue to, to chat, uh, pretty regularly. And, uh, I hope that we can find an opportunity to work together again. Well, please give her my personal best. I, I I really liked how she makes you want to know more about what she's thinking and what she's feeling. And uh, a lot of strength in her performance, but lots of vulnerability, too. A great combination. And yes, a fantastic performance. And I think it's uplifting when someone of her status, so to speak, in the industry is willing to step outside of that and do a project like yours, Miles. Uh, because I think that that, that is a, a, a beautiful and wonderful thing when, when a person can do that. And Lindsay, I would love to ask you, um, you know, what is it like to be directed by your husband? <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it's, it's really an interesting process for us, right? Because, we're so involved in all of the aspects of the artistic creation from its inception. So I'm watching him and Mike write the script together. I'm contributing ideas, um, little things like what to name the girl character, Amalia, to, you know, bigger things like, oh, that God seems like Carlitos. And, um, and just being involved all along, and as a producer, you know, discussing casting and needing an actress that can do that strength with that vulnerability and, and settling on someone like Rachel and having her, you know, give us that vote of confidence and stuff. So by the time we get on set, there's very little direction to be done because we've talked about everything. So we've discussed all of it. I know what he's looking for emotionally or in terms of power in a scene because we've talked about it for the last six months before we get on set. So by the time we're there, um, it's really about blocking. Um, and, you know, a little bit like, you're doing that weird thing with your nostrils. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in terms, in terms of direction from Miles, I have a very different relationship with the mm -hmm. director than anybody else because we work so closely and for so long. Um, and so it's not so much of like a, I need you to feel this in this way, but it's kind of more like, I hated the way that you did that word. Let's redo this. Um, because I know that when we get into the editing room, you'll ring me out <laughs> <laughs> if you see that look on your face on the screen. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's very, very, um, you know, we, 
from the outside, it probably looks a little bit uh, contentious because we are so honest with each other about what the other one cares about. Like, I know when we get into the editing room, Miles is going to care about this. So on the day, I'm going to tell him, hey, you're not going to want that. And vice versa, right? So it's, um, it's, it's, it's really fun, and it's a really great element of our working together. But from the outside, it probably looks like chaos. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is great. I mean, just think what that brings to each of you. Um, you know, you, you, having each other's backs or, or suggestions, ideas, uh, any number of things. And it probably helps you be even more prepared for the film because you're, you're living together and you can talk about it all you want. And that probably gives you almost a head start, it seems to me. And I just thought I would ask, Lindsay, if I were to say to you that in my estimation... Miles is probably the type of director that would sincerely be open and welcome to a cast member saying, hey, can I just try this a little bit different than the script? Or is it possible maybe to add in a word or remove something? Would I be correct on that assumption? Oh, absolutely. Miles is such an incredibly collaborative director. Um, He really is able to ride that line of, I'm the director and, you know, what I say goes, I have the final say, I'm the arbiter of, you know, all of this going on. And also, I know that I might not be the smartest person in the room at any given moment. I know that there might be somebody with a better idea. You know, he's really, really great at doing both of those things and letting cast members um, and and sometimes even crew members like a, a gaffer or something can be like, hey, you know, I just have this really great idea for how to light this to make it feel the way you want it to feel. And he's really, he gives people that space to be creative and to find ownership of their job, of the role that they're fulfilling. But he's also able to say, mm, that's not quite right. So let's do it this way. One thing that he does do, though, is even if he doesn't necessarily agree with it, he'll let them play. He lets people play because so much can be found in those moments of, well, I'm not sure if this is going to work, but let's throw it at the wall and see if it sticks. Um, He's really, really wonderful about that. Um, And I probably don't play as much as I could because I already kind of know what he wants. But the other actors, especially um, actors like, you know, Bill Sadler and... um, Will Forsythe and Rachel Nichols, when they're in a room with him, he's so incredibly generous with the creativity. And he's not jealous of that. It doesn't only belong to him. He knows that he doesn't have a monopoly on the creative energy in a room. So he's really, really great at letting actors um, play and find new meanings of truth and stuff. So it's, it's, it really is very fun to watch people um, get to collaborate with him. Not surprised to hear about any of this at all. And it's good to know that my my uh, artistic um, antenna was working properly because that's just the, the, the right, feeling right. that I was getting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to ask you now, Lindsay, if you could give maybe a description of your character. And what did you find the most challenging about portraying her? My character, Hedeka, is um, kind of the eldest, most senior member of the priestesses of Ternunos in this film. Um, she kind of is... With a very interesting look. Yes, yeah. So I usually, every <laughs> every film that we make, I'm like, oh, I have to look pretty in this one. Or like, oh, do I look okay? But in this one, it was just like, absolutely not. Throw <laughs> it out the window. Um, <laughs> so when the... when. Mike and Miles started working on this script. I'm like reading it and I'm like, well, I know I can't be the lead. What could I possibly play here? <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely not Latara. Um, I'm not Fel. And Hedica was originally written as an old, old woman, like super wizened, craggly face, all of this stuff. And I was like, yeah, I want that one. <laughs> um, and both Miles and Mike were like, no, she's, to be old like she's like the leader of this group and I'm like yeah mm-hmm, no I want that one <laughs> um and and so I I you know uh when Ashley Treadaway came on as our uh makeup and special effects makeup um head I uh I you know she and I just started talking and she had this great idea for this huge scar to run down my face and like you know I had the white eye and and all this stuff and it was so fun to get 
play with makeup and to not, you know, mm. I'm, I'm incredibly, you know, I have some body confidence issues and stuff. So every film we do, I'm like, Ooh, I have to look as skinny as possible, even though, you know, I'm not your sample size and all this, all this stuff. But for this film, I didn't care about any of that. And it was really freeing to not have to worry about that, which was good because I had to speak in German most of the time and I don't speak German. It is not one of the languages that I studied. I studied ancient Greek and Latin and French. <laughs> so German was, was definitely a, uh, a challenge for me. Um, I also, because I wear so many hats, um, commonly I don't get as much time studying the script um, for lines and stuff. So I'm, I'm usually like still working on stuff late in the game, whereas a lot of actors will come in and they'll already be fully memorized. And, and I just sometimes don't have that luxury. So the, the German was really difficult because you can't ad lib in a language you don't speak. And I am an ad libber. So that was also difficult. Like, okay, I have to, I have to make these sounds because they, it doesn't make sense without these sounds. And I can't add anything because I don't know the language. Um, and so that's really where Elena came in clutch because she was thrust into this role last minute. Um, and so she didn't have anything memorized either, which was really heartening for me. So like nights before scenes, like she would be reading her, her stuff. And I was like, Oh, I'm not the only one. Um, (laughs) but she was also really great. Like if we were talking about a scene, like the day before we were shooting it and, and, and she would always uh, call her mom and make sure because she is a native speaker, but she just wanted to really make sure like this German is super good. And, and, you know, Ollie and her mom are from different areas in Germany and with dialects and stuff like that, there were always like some slight little changes um, and things like that. Um, but it was really cool if we wanted to add something or if I wanted to ad lib or if Miles wanted to change something, we just like, hey, Elena, or like we would text Ollie and we really had that wonderful opportunity to, to play with that that wouldn't have been there um, had we not had that unfortunate issue. But um, I would say that that was the most challenging thing for me because I, I have never done anything that difficult in my entire life um, than have to speak all of those German words in a language that I'm really not <laughs> familiar with. <laughs> well, Lindsay, uh, let me just say up front, you always look very appealing well, thank you. Uh, in any of the films <laughs> I've seen you in. So let me just say that first and, and foremost. And would it be a compliment if I were to say to you now that when I first saw you in this movie, I didn't actually even know if it was you at first? Yes. Absolutely. Awesome. 100%. Because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I hadn't seen actually any photos of you beforehand. And I'm uh-huh. like, wait a minute. It kind of looks like her. But <laughs> what? <laughs> so the first day that I tried out the white eyes, um, the white contact, it was the day before mm. my, my first day. Um, but I was, because it completely obscures that eye. So I wanted to make sure that like my depth perception wouldn't be off and stuff like that. Because we're in like hills and mountains and, and with all of these trees and all of these branches. And I didn't want to, you know, in the middle of a take, like get sideswept by a branch and then have to reset. Um, so <laughs> I practiced with the white eye and everybody on set, just like I walked onto set and everybody got a little quiet. And then at lunch, <laughs> one of my friends came up and, and she said, do you know that they're trying to decide if that's real? And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, they're trying to decide oh, if you wow. wear a contact every day to cover your white eye or if the white eye is a contact. I was like, oh, so they don't know. That's great. Ooh. The people who literally have been with <laughs> me for three days, all of a sudden see the white eye and they're like, holy shit, is that real? <laughs> so um, that was super <laughs> cool. And as always, yeah. that's how we get our Oscars. Ladies have to pretend to be ugly in order mm-hmm. to get Oscar. Right, Shirley well, Stang, w- Hillary Swank. Um, Nicole Kidman. <laughs> that's how we get our Oscars. <laughs> Absolutely, and, and what a what a fantastic performance you gave. Uh, by oh, the way, thank you. It was very fun, Miles. I have to ask you this: 
uh, speaking of the demigod itself, there's such a sense of evil as I'm watching. And uh, like almost an unforgiving evil. Not really worried about other people's feelings and all of that. I just have to say, was there some sort of special effects for all of this? I mean, I, I just, whoever was doing the makeup for the character, I just have to say, I mean, I really did get chills in so many of those scenes. Well, I appreciate that so much. And that's really a testament to the work of production designer Julie Tosh, uh, makeup head Ashley Treadaway, and Lindsay. The three of them collaborated very closely on the look of. Uh, the priestesses, the witches, and uh, Karen Unos himself. Uh, we knew we wanted to diverge from the traditional look of Karen Unos a little bit and make him more feral, more bestial. Um, typically, he's depicted as sort of an older man with a long beard and the antlers of a stag. We wanted something a little more animal. And, um, I, you know, I think uh, the design elements really came through. And it's just a combination of, uh, of once again, Julie's work and, and, and Ashley's and Lindsay's costume design, um, which is, which well is done, very, Lindsay. yeah. Um, which, which is, is of course this sort of throw back the core ass right to his roots in the ancient, uh, late antique world. Right. Um, and, and the and voice we, miles, I mean, yes. wow. I mean, uh, if I closed my eyes and heard that voice and didn't even see what the appearance was, I would still be terrified. Yeah, so so it begins with casting the actor who has a vocal quality that can get close to what you're looking for. Obviously, you know, what is Darth Vader without James Earl Jones? But, it, it, but there's an effect on that voice as well, right? There's some sound design there as well. Mm -hmm. And yes. So Chima Chekwa, who, is, who plays Karen Unos in our film, uh, uh, has a, a, a deep, resonant voice. That's just his instrument. But also we ha have to give kudos to our, our post-production sound team, St. Thomas Ledoux and John Vogel in particular, um, for creating that effect, which, which made that voice creepier and more resonant. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, and, and, and Chima is wearing a mask. So uh, every line that you hear in the movie is recorded after the fact in a studio um, or recorded wild on the day in the space. Um, mm -hmm. none, of, none of the lines are the actual production lines because when he's wearing the mask, it, it obscures his, the, the line, the tone of his voice. And one thing that I wanted to be very careful of is I, I, I still wanted to make sure that he could be understood. You know, occasionally you see films with characters wearing masks and, and the voice is kind of muffled and it, you can't really understand what's being said. So I, I wanted to make sure that we could still understand uh, what he's saying. Um, so, so it really was a team oh, effort. Boy. Yeah. It, well, you succeeded. One wonderful component of, Chima's performance is he has this really musical vocal delivery, which almost made it possible for our production, for our post-production sound team to play his voice like an instrument um, and really play with it and do all these things because he does have that ability to have that deep resonant voice, but he also has these, you know, really beautiful uppers and, and there's a great range um, of, of delivery in his performance that it just it's so interesting and it's not necessarily what you would expect absolutely and i don't want to give anything away of that's not my style at all so let me ask this in a very careful <laughs> sort of way there is a shot of running where he is running and again, Miles, perhaps this was your intention, or maybe you were just trying something um, unique or a certain style. But for me, I actually found it part of what was terrifying was the way that uh, you showed him running, where he's like instantly almost there, yet you're seeing, you know, the legs move. I, I just thought that was a great, great shot. Yeah, thank you. We, we, we cranked the speed on that, on that shot, if it's the shot I'm thinking about. Uh, 
so it's it's literally sped up in camera um and that's one of the things that yeah we wanted to do on this film we wanted to capture as much of the film as possible and as many of the effects as possible in camera um and that includes almost all of the gore that includes um almost all of the uh the uh, Kernuno's eye effect uh which we did with LED lights underneath the mask um it, it, yeah that was well done because too because the fact of the matter is it just reads more true uh when it's in camera about 95% of the time i mean um you know you even look at something like when when peter jackson shot lord of the rings and gollum even though he knew that was going to be a cgi character he still put Andy Serkis in the scene with a motion capture suit saying the lines, you know, and mapping his face. And of course, you know, one of the great tricks in all of cinema uh, resulted. So, so we wanted to capture as much as we could in camera. And, and that particular scene, we just, we took some chances here. You know, we, there are some whip pans and some things that, you know, might've seemed a little scary or, or weird or, or whatever, and, and ramping that shot, the running shot, it was one. And and uh, Nate Nate Tate, the director of photography, and I were just we spent a lot of time talking about the, these types of things we wanted to do on the day, and we just decided, hey, let's go for it. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You know? Absolutely. I was just going to say that you know, speaking of Peter Jackson, what's interesting is, and not in all of the photography, but in the action photography of the Karen character, there is very much. Uh, an evocation of the Urukai, right? From the Lord of the Rings, there's kind of a it's it's a similar um, uh, I hate to use the term bestial, but you know a very like menacing character, and the the photography I think really gets that across, and it does feel like that to me. Well, it, it's I mean the the thing is he is Carnunos is nature, right? He is the wild. He is the untamed, right? And and he says at one point, you know, many have worshipped me knowingly or or unknowingly, um, which means that if you're outside in nature having some kind of mystical experience, some some nature animism or something like that, you should visit the Grand Canyon for the first time, or you're in the middle of the forest and you feel something spiritual, and you feel something welling up in your chest. Carnunos is saying, that's me. Mm. I'm there. And so we really wanted to capture, we really wanted to capture that wild, natural, um, animal spirit of him. You know, so he is, he is part, he is a demigod. He is a half God, right? So there is, there is humanity in him, but there is also divinity in him. Um, and the divine side is nature itself. And so we really wanted to, and nature is dangerous. It's beautiful and dangerous. And we really wanted to capture that with the design of the character. Well, Demigod arrives, as I mentioned earlier on in the episode, October 15th in selected theaters and also on streaming services, I believe. I'd like to personally recommend a film to any horror fans out there or folks who enjoy independent filmmaking or fans of... uh, uh, of Rachel Nichols, most definitely uh, an outstanding performance from her. And Miles, uh, you just keep uh, uh, cranking out this uh, just incredible work, and uh, I just like your style very much. I want to say congratulations to you both. But I thought we would conclude with me asking you both, obviously you enjoy this type of filmmaking, which you uh, referred to earlier, but have you ever thought the both of you go, you know what, maybe someday down the road, how about we do a drama or how about we do a different type of story? <laughs> or is this just something that's just way too much fun for now to even think of going a different direction? Well, it's funny you say that, uh, Stephen, because uh, Lindsay and I just completed a script, uh, which is sort of dark comedy, character drama, quasi-musical if you were to take a Noah Baumbach film and a Wong Kar Wai film and a Wes Anderson film and put them all in the blender, blend it up, and then add like an 80s Duran Duran music video, that's this film. So <laughs> we are, we, 
we are. Hey, I grew up in the are, 80s. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we are uh, looking to do do that film hopefully next sometime next year. Nice. Uh, we all, all already have our buddy Jeremy London attached to it. Um, so uh, that's great. Yeah, I mean, my roots actually are in are are in character drama. My first film is a chamber drama set in academia. Um, it, you know, in the spirit of something like um, Dead Poet Society or or Goodwill Hunting. So uh, we got into making uh, uh, horror films, uh, the third film down the line, because the second film, The Hollow, is a Southern noir crime drama thriller. Um, Yeah, and then, you know, we had always heard, well, horror films just have more um, marketing potential. There's a bigger marketplace. Yeah, and it is, it's a, it's, Look, the, the horror playground is vast and wonderful, and you can do all sorts of different things. And there's so many different types of horror within the genre, right? Whether we're talking about um, psychological horror or ghost stories or slasher or w- whatever it might be, uh, you know, social commentary. I mean, look at the how powerful something like Get Out was. I mean, there's 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 just so it's a, it's a genre that is so ripe with dramatic possibility. Um, so once we, once we dipped our toe in the water, uh, with our third film, uh, demons, which is, was sort of an homage to a lot of things that we, that I love the exorcist and, um, you know, first and foremost and the omen, maybe a little bit and some other stuff. Um, which we, we, we just sort of, we we stayed there and, and to to and inhabited that world for the last few films. But no, we really I really do have the pangs of uh, the the need to get back to my roots a little bit in character drama and which is by the way probably my favorite genre <laughs> uh, of film and television. Um, so that hopefully uh, that'll be what we do next. We're not gonna. I mean. I'm always going to be open to, to, to the horror genre. And I mean, I'd love to do a sequel to Demigod. I think there's so many possibilities there. Some of that, of course, will depend on how successful the first film is. Um, but yeah, we are, we are thinking about branching out. Well, I'm very excited to hear about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we actually did uh, try our hand at writing a romantic comedy, but as it turns out, we're both kind of weird and it, it, um, it didn't end up very funny or very, very romantic in the long run. So. <laughs> we might yeah. not be doing that, but we well, might be getting back into drama. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, you both can um, no doubt give a, a great performance, and no matter what style of film it is, and. Um, I already look forward to having uh, hopefully each of you back down the road to discuss more of your projects. And Miles, let me just say, one of the things I love about your work is that you don't just provide viewers horror, you provide them the other elements of horror, which I think is the best, an emotional journey. So Rachel's character is already experiencing a great deal of emotions and 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 you provide that it seems like in all your films a character or two is going on some sort of emotional journey and when you put it all together with the horror you have a miles doliak film well that means a great deal steven i mean i believe that story is character and character is story and the lifeblood of character is conflict and change transformation um so uh, that means a great deal. Uh, uh, hopefully all of my protagonists are on a quest or on some kind of journey um, to attain something, to fill some lack, to answer some unanswered question, whether they actually do that or no. Hopefully at least the audience is, is bought in and willing to go along for the ride. Thank you to each of you for this delightful and informative and fun conversation. Uh, Miles, always a pleasure to speak with you. And Lindsay, I just had so much fun finally getting to speak with you today. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen, for supporting indie filmmakers and indie film. And um, keep an eye out for us uh, and our film. I'm at at Miles underscore Doliac on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, You can also follow at Gravitas Ventures. That's our distributor 
and we'll both be blasting out information about the release of the film. And check it out, hopefully on the big screen. If you're in a city where it's on the big screen and you feel safe um, going out to the movies, hopefully you're fully vaccinated and wearing a mask, but nevertheless. Um, and uh, if not, watch it on the biggest screen possible at your home or at your friend's house or, or wherever. It was meant to be seen on a, on a big screen. Absolutely. With good sound. <laughs> and, actually, <laughs> and actually seeing a movie in the theaters these days is really lovely because it's never crowded. So it's probably yeah. safer than it was before. Well, as a James Bond film fan, I can tell you that after two or three delays, I can hardly wait until next weekend. That's all I got to say. I will be yeah, at the I'm cinema. Gonna, yeah, we're going to see No Time. Yeah. We're going to see No Time to Die. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Hi, friends and listeners. This is host Stephen Brittingham. Do you happen to have a question or a comment for me? Or perhaps you feel that you might make an interesting guest here on Hollywood and Beyond. Whatever your reason may be, please feel free to contact me anytime directly at the show's official email address. That would be Hollywood and Beyond Show at gmail.com. That is Hollywood and Beyond Show at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you soon.